Hi, welcome to the DP Developer Zone. So we do this um, DP Developer Zone every Thursday, 8 a.m. London time. Today is actually 7.30 a.m. London time. And the background behind me is slightly changed. So that sort of gives you a indication that um, sometimes we're traveling and today um, we are traveling. So it's a little bit of a earlier start and um, I essentially have to jump straight into it. So today is the 16th of March, 2023. And I will sort of, you know, I bring up this and say, you know, we do have ZP Academy. So if you're interested in questions or getting a sense of the kind of scientific content at ZP, ZP Academy is good. Webinars, we're true to our words, you know, that we say every Thursday at 8 a.m. London time. <laughs> Admittedly, this is 30 minutes early. You know, we will answer questions. Technical questions are in here. Um, commercial questions are in here. We do have our collaborations. In fact, this week, um, I'm at a city in the UK called Swansea. Um, we do have a lot of collaborations, and maybe I'll put that up on the blog. Um, so it, if you're sort of interested in general news, we do do a, also a vlog and a podcast on a Sunday at 8 a.m. London time, um, and there we highlight things that we put into the blog um, during the week. Let me go a little bit faster. Now, I'm going a little bit faster because, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of meetings, a lot of um, traveling today. We do promote jobs. I do ask people to follow us on LinkedIn regarding jobs. And we have, do have the ZP Developer Zone. And we have workshops. So last week, there was a workshop um, in Horten in the um, Norway. We do have workshops now lined up for both in Norway and in the UK for April. If you see a, if you see a link on any of these slides, you should know that the link is also... Um, and it will also be underneath the video as well. So I'll go a little bit faster because I want to kind of be, um, want to be efficient with your time and I also want to be efficient obviously with ZP time. So question number one is about recommendation on equivalent circuits in Julie. So if you're making an immunosensor, you're making an immunosensor on gold, for example, you may be using differential pulse voltammetry, but you might also be using um, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy and equivalent circuits then become um, a useful tool. So I will touch upon equivalent circuits in Julie. Um, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine um, ATP is one of the sort of the many important um, molecules in the body, but ATP is the kind of energy currency of the body. So I will discuss that. Um, recommendations on platinum and um, gold electrodes. Essentially, um, we'll discuss that. Um, I'll make a couple of recommendations and I'll also say that um, and I'll say it now and I'll say it when it comes around as well. The problem with electrodes is and people ask you, well, how long do they last? And it, it just really depends what you do with them. Um, for example, if you're measuring ferry ferrocyanide in solution, that's a very mild application. And, you know, the electrodes will last a long time. If you're trying to do self-assembled monolayers on gold, where there's a kind of gold thiol bond, that's going to be pretty um strong bonds and if you want to sort of take that thiol layer off or the self assembled monolayer off that gold that's gonna be pretty tough um if people are asking for platinum electrodes they're generally sort of doing some sort of oxidase well not generally but often doing an oxidase um enzyme type reaction now you may be using polymers to hold those pot those enzymes onto the electrode at which point you're sort of essentially irreversibly binding the enzyme and so getting the ends getting the enzyme back off is kind of irreversible so um, in when you're making commercial products, you should you can never really guarantee the wetted products, the things that are wetted by science and biology. It's very hard to guarantee them because you really have little control over what people are doing. Um, so I would say that how long things last really depends on how long you're or what you're using them for. Um, question number four is about measuring um, oleo resins. I will dis define oleo resins and measuring the Scoville heat units. This is something that. For example, people in South Africa are measuring um, capsaicin, and that's something that we do. Um, corroded electrodes, I'll just, just touch upon that. Somebody got some of our hypervalue electrodes. Um, we have replaced them, but it's just interesting that in the storage, um, the temperature and humidity had really corroded them. Um, I've never seen it before, so I suppose it's just to highlight that 
you know, if you want to obviously store stuff and it wasn't this person's fault, um, it's keep them in a dark, cool, dry place. So in this point, in this one, they were kept in a dark place, um, but they needed to be dry um, and cool as well. Um, cost of gold electrodes. When I see a question like this, it makes me think really about um, it should be it's worth to talk about the cost to get to actual market rather than just the cost of electrodes. You know, there's a big picture here that the cost of small numbers of electrodes shouldn't really be the it's important, but it's, it shouldn't actually be the critical point when making commercial decisions. And I have to put in the cost of electrodes for R&D in the context of what it really costs to actually get to market. Um, question number one. Um, this is a nice question. It came in from the um, YouTube channel. So I definitely want to address it. Um, and on the YouTube channel, um, we put a video up recently. And I wish I'd linked to the video, but I realized just before this um, webinar this morning um, that we had linked to the video. But Julie, I'm super biased, is a really good um, database, free to academia, where you can upload your data, store your data, share your data. Um, it really takes care of the problem that we definitely see that um, people simply don't have good uh, management of data at, uh, within their projects. Um, anyway, so we have Julie. It's a cloud database. I put a link to it down below. Now, what's nice about Julie is you can put EIS data into Julie, electrochemical and peanut spectroscopy data into Julie. Um, and Julie will actually, it's called a black box. You know, what, it's a sort of, and what I mean by that is Julie has to know nothing about your circuit in order to, or about your experiment in order to actually make a prediction on the um, equivalent circuit. The questioner was asking, and I like this, um, person because they do ask questions they're quite engaged with the channel um what they were asking was well how do you do it okay so we've actually got a, a database in julie um so we're actually it's sometimes you can the, the wheel could be quite the update window on julie could be slow when doing this because essentially it's going through the database um and checking out all the equivalent circuits in the database and seeing which database um actually fits the um the data best. So we've got all these circuits in the database. They're all in sequentially going through all these circuits and um, fitting the data to those circuits. And in the end, it does all of them. And then it ends up choosing um, the equivalent circuit that's got the best um, fit, which it does by a chi squared value. Um, and so database of circuits, um, your data is then put into those circuits and Julie finds out which circuit actually best um, models your actual data. But it's unusual, see, because with most um, uh, sort of fitting circuits, they need you to give them a starting point. Julie's weird on this one, not weird. It's a real revolution that actually you have to make no guesses. Now, what's really powerful then is actually Julie gives you original reference. And so you can sort of look up that reference um, and say, okay, you know, is that reasonable? Um, you know, read the paper, know your own experiment and say, is it reasonable that this circuit um, is a good model for my data? So very powerful, very much appreciate the question. And I think in time, the database will get bigger and we'll also get faster. What I mean, you know, because obviously sequentially going through um, essentially models and trying to fit all of them. You can understand the computational power that requires. So um, bear with us, but I would, you know, that's the nice thing about cloud systems, you know, jump on it, use it. Um, and just know that, you know, the biggest users of Julia are actually ZP. And so we'll make it better and better to benefit us. Like many of our products, we're the biggest users of it and um, things get better because we want them to be better. Lovely question. Thank you for the engagement. Um, and it, as I say, it should help in scenarios like this where you've got some data like an immunosensor, be it gold or carbon, and it can really help you um, figure out your equivalent circuit for that kind of data. Question number two, at ZP, um, somebody's very interested in our ATP sensor, adenosine triphosphate sensor. The ATP sensor works at 600 to 650. Sorry, I should just say, be very specific about it. We'll recommend 650 millivolts, so it's an amperometric type sensor. Um, We've got a couple of form factors. One of them is a microbiosensor, and one of them is more of a screen printed electrode. 
um, form factor. So I'll bring them up. So this is ATP itself, adenosine triphosphate. Um, any links, I've already put them underneath the video. So we do have the microbiosensor. The microbiosensor is a sensor, it's a working electrode only. Um, it's a little glass capillary with a sort of platinum material in there and the enzymes are all immobilized on the sensor, but it's just the working electrode. So when you're using that, you do need a um, counter electrode. Um, we also then have the screen printed version, but with the microbiosensor, it's just the working electrode. Um, with the um, sort of screen printed format, you've got um, reference electrode, working electrode, and counter electrode. So one of the questions, there's questions from the questioner, was about whether we could, whether they need an external reference and counter. And the answer is, if you're using the microbiosensor, the answer is yes. If you're using the more of the screen printed format, no, all the electrodes are integrated um, onto the sensor. Um, the other question then was, um, how do you actually use this microbiosensor? So um, anything you see, so um, I'll also have a link underneath below. So there's a kit um, and there's the biosensor itself. The way you use it is you take um, the, let's say, sensing electrode. Um, and the sensing electrode is this one in the image with the crocodile clip. And you take the reference electrode. Um, and I've put an image um, here, but it's also, you can find this object or this product also in the links. And so you have both electrodes. Now, when your currents are small and your electrodes are small, you can put current through the reference electrodes. You don't need to run in the three electrode mode. You can run in the two electrode mode. Um, Dexcom make a CGM and they run in the two electron mode. Um, so we have these two electrodes that are sitting in a pot. So we apply a voltage of, I should say, potential because the units of voltage, I have been corrected on this before, I do know, of a potential 650 millivolts and we get a current. Now, the way this would work is you have a, let's say, uh, the uh, electrodes in the solution. You add in a bit of ATP and the signal will jump. You add in a bit more ATP and the signal will jump and you add in a bit more ATP and the signal will jump. Just out of interest, today is the 16th of March, 2023. It's probably worth saying that we did put a nice video up there this week about a CGM, a continuous glucose monitoring um, sensor. It's one of the nicest videos we've put up about that, so it's worth um, checking that video out as well. Um, if you're joining late today, just know that it's because um, we're traveling this week and we really have to start um, early. So you can get a nice staircase response out of this ATP sensor. The, way, the, the intention of this sensor was actually designed to do um, uh, neuroscience. So you would take um, a Petri dish, you put a brain slice in there, um, you would put what's called um, artificial um, cerebrospinal fluid in there. Um, you would put the, um, the sensors into that, and you may then um, stimulate some sort of um, event in that tissue. And you essentially look at the ATP um, spike or surge. So that's sort of typically what people have used the microbiosensor for. And there's been at least 36 papers, which um, I've linked to um here so it's quite well used in the neuroscience world this micro biosensor atp um i'm just gonna Hello. now we have another form factor for the atp what i like about electrochemistry is it's a true platform that the the underlying science is not going to change the form factor is going to change quite a bit but suddenly i'm going to show you that you know we can use this atp sensor in a number of different ways i the only reason I'm going to stop on this graph at the moment is somebody was interested in measuring 10 um, micromolar um, of solution. You can see that we do have um, we have signal response up to 60 micromolar, or at least that's the data that we've gathered. So 10 is, is completely fine. Um, and again, you know, any links are hopefully already underneath the video. This is a very different form factor though, because in this form factor, we're expecting people to bring a sample to the electrode and just get results. We kind of call this platform our sense it all platform. Um, and in fact, you know, there is a video and it is um, linked to underneath this video. So in this video, it's more about bringing the sample to the sensor rather than the sensor to the sample. With that microbiosensor, sensor, I was showing the idea of sensors in the dish. Here, you would take the sample, maybe put it in a, Eppendorf like this, add some buffer, um, and then they would mix, at which point then you would 
take the sample and put it on a sensor and you would read it. So the workflow um, is um, sensor into the meter um, app on the smartphone connects to the meter. You have the Judy Cloud database. By the way, if you're developing any products um, in any kind of continent in the world, including Africa, we do have all this in place already. So sensor um, electronics app, Judy Cloud. So you put the sensor into the meter and the sample goes um, onto the um, meter and um, the, the app tells the meter what to do and the um, meter gives the data back to the app and the app gives the data to Julie and Julie sends the data to the cloud and then back on your phone you get you know millimolar parts p and ppm I should say so um, the next thing I'm going to jump to slightly is um, somebody would like um, some recommendations on gold and platinum electrodes the recommendation is easier um, our sensors are not necessarily one-time use but the number of times that you can use them really depends on what you want to do if you want to do a simple experiment with fairy ferrocyanide um, then i suspect you can use them not suspect i know you can use them again and again but if you start um, polymerizing or immobilizing materials on those electrodes then they could really only be they may only be one time use um, so the cleaning cycle may end up damaging the electrodes so i've put um, some links to what i think is our best um, quality and value um, electrodes and I hope that will help you sort of narrow in what you're looking for. Question number four is about um, oleo resins. So oleo resins, um, this is a general term that sort of comes from the food industry. So you want to extract something from um, a plant substance. It could be ginger, it could be chilies. Um, you use an organic solvent to do the extraction and then you essentially remove the organic solvent. You're just kind of left with this tarry I don't say, you know, with these, I won't say the word mess, but this tarry material, which should contain a lot of the um, um, active. So in the case of chilies, it would be capsaicin. And the question was, could we use our food sense technology? I've put a link here um, to measure these capsaicins. Um, so the, all these samples came in, we did analyze them on the food sense, and we could clearly see the um, capsaicin activity. So yeah, it worked, um, really no issues. Question number five, um, in this one, the, the client, um, as I say, there's three, there's three, um, three factors at least that you need to, if you want to kind of ensure the stability of, of many materials in life, um, dark, cool, and dry are um, good ideas. In this case, we have replaced this for this particular client because um, what happened was um, they, were, they were kept dark, but I suspect... Um, well, in the end, they corroded, and so it's just, um, I will not say speculation, it's speculation based on a sort of scientific theory that um, these things have got too hot and too humid, and therefore they've actually corroded. So it's, um, they say rusting here, but um, rusting really just means probably sort of, it's gone brown and we've got really formed silver oxide. So it's probably just worth knowing that, obviously, to kind of keep your electrodes in pristine condition, cool, dark, and dry, um, is the optimum um, conditions so we took a look at that you can't absolutely say you know where this happened but in this case you know we did um, replace it obviously question number six is really about cost of electrodes so um, somebody's interested in um, purchasing um, electrodes they would like them at essentially less than five um, euros or less um, so I have um, any links that you see me using, you know, I sort of do lay out, you know, that we have screen printed gold electrodes, sputter gold electrodes, um, and PCB gold electrodes. What I am saying is the cost of electrodes at low volume shouldn't really be the decision point because um, the cost of electrodes for an R&D scale project is no real reflection on the cost of your absolute product. So I just want to put... I want to put this in context. I mean, quality is actually more important than cost. Um, you can waste a lot of time um, on low cost electrodes and suddenly find that, you know, if it's enic, they're corroding. If it's screen printed electrodes, the underlying gold is so variable that you can't build a biosensor upon that variable screen printed electrodes. You've got to be really careful with this term 
you know, cost um, in your R&D phases. Now, let's talk, because there's a bigger picture here. What does it cost to actually, you know, forget whether something's five euros or less. What does it really cost to make an IVD? So this is looking at um, the um, commercial companies making in vitro diagnostics um, from about 1983 up to about 2005. ISTAT, this is an electrochemical system. Um, Biosite, Abaxis, these are all either making hand handheld devices or um, desktop devices, that's the Abaxis device. Um, Cepheid, you know, spending 85 million. Epocal, spending um, just over 40 million. Sphere Medical, spending over 30 million um, US dollars. Tier Lab, which is the most simple device ever, spent the least at 10 million. Um, and then Claros DX, um, around about 10 million. Um, so there's a whole, you know, let's say span of costs here, but the average to make an IVD um, was about 38 million. But the problem with these numbers is, whoops a daisy, and if you take out Tier Lab, it's about 42 million. So Tier Lab is an exceptionally simple device. It was gold electrodes, but um, there was no functionalization of that gold, so exceptionally um, low cost. Now, if I adjust these device, these prices, and actually put them into 2021 prices, you'll find out that actually the um, cost to get to um, regulatory approval was 74.7 million US dollars. So it's really important, um, you know, when talking to people, you know, about the cost of materials, um, to understand, you know, the cost of this entire program is gonna really cost. So, uh, you know, when people come to me and say, you know, then, um, you know, we've got funding of this, you know, X millions. That's a really important parameter because it tells me that they've truly understood the cost of um, development. Um, now, if we take out Tier Lab, that's actually 83.8 million. So it's, you know, for me, these are the sort of numbers that I, when, when people work with ZP, I'll show this in a bit, actually they do it for a lot lower cost but because of the experience of the team. But I think we're one of the few sort of companies that would, you know, where people are approached for screen printed gold electrodes, for example, or gold electrodes, we're able to actually put, you know, we're able to tell them, you know, this is what it truly costs to develop these kind of products. Now, this is in US dollars. Um, but what it says here is that the average time that it took a company to develop a product is obviously seven years. Um, and the ISTAT, um, as an example here, um, Epocal was the same founder and he did it uh, much quicker. So Eistat actually did it first time around nine years. Same um, founder did it again later on, but in a new company and did it in six years. And he actually reduced his costs um, by 50%. So second time around, he did it a lot lower cost. Um, so well, that what that's called is experience. And I think that's what ZP brings as well. That often actually when we're doing um, in vitro diagnostic development and manufacturing for people, we generally can do this in sort of two and a half years. Um, whereas actually most startups take about seven years um, to do this. And it's just really experience. Um, so it, it's important to obviously get good prices, but be careful because good prices early on in the project, in the context of what this project is really going to cost you, um, you know, these are really small, you know, numbers and factors. It's better to find a vendor that you like than to necessarily go for the lowest cost vendor. So question number one, recommendation on the equivalent circuit. Junie, Junie has the ability now to look at your data, feed it to equivalent circuits from the literature, tell you which circuit's the best, and then give you the reference as well so you can go and read the paper. It's pretty powerful. Um, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, we've got microbiosensors for the detection of this, and we've also got this kind of screen printed format for the detection of this. I have recommended a platinum and gold electrodes. Whether you can reuse them depends on what you do with them. We could reuse them if we're doing simple science like very ferrocyanide oxidations. Or layer resins, these are something that occur quite a lot, I think, um, in the food industry, and we can measure the capsaicin in these layer resins from um, chilies. The corroded electrodes is just a sort of a general note that um, most materials, a lot of materials in life, you know, if you want to stop um, things like corrosion or, or just um, degradation, keep them um, keep them cool, keep them dark, and keep them dry, and then you should be okay. And then the cost of gold electrodes, 
Um, we do do gold electrodes at less than five euros each, but it's really about volume. The higher the volume, the lower the cost. And you should keep costs of your R&D phase in context of what it can cost you to really get to market. Um, I think at ZP, we actually do people much faster, much lower cost. But that's really just based on experience. So I just want to finish with a thank you. Um, so I apologize. I had to start early this week. We are um, traveling. Um, literally, I have to go down and do some meetings now. Um, but I did want to get essentially get this going um, and get this up for the, all the questions that came in this week. So if you have any questions of ZP, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, some of these questions are kind of ongoing questions. And so I'm happy to kind of have this ongoing um, video chat, let's say. So have a good week and I shall speak to you um, soon. Take care. Bye bye.